20. We're also going to be in Genesis 9, 20. Now, tonight we're looking at the altar study, looking at the first mention. You say, my gosh, it's the third time of the first mention. Uh, and actually, you look back, the first uh, message we preached was on the first mention as well, but not in the detail. Uh, we've preached several times. As far as I know, this is the last first mention, but I'm telling you, uh, I really think this is going to be a powerful uh, help to us. I, I know in study, the Lord was a blessing. It was a blessing to me. But Genesis 8, verse number 20, we've read this text multiple times. We're going to read it again, and then we're going to read 9 and 20. And it says this, Genesis 8 and 20, it says, And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now we know of that as being the um, first mention of the altar. But here's the deal. Noah goes from altar building to vineyard planting. Look in Genesis 9 and verse number 20. And Noah began to be a, a husbandman. And he planted a vineyard. Now wait just a minute. There's no coincidence in our Bible. In Genesis 8, 20, Noah built an altar. In Genesis 9 and 20, we read that he planted a vineyard. In verse 21, it says, He drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we pray that you help us. Anoint us here this evening. And Lord, just... Uh, Speak to us and use us, Lord, and, and just, uh, if nothing else, Lord, just let this seed fall on good ground, Lord, and let it multiply, Lord, and use your word as only you, the Holy Spirit can this evening. Take it and use it mightily in Jesus' name, amen and amen. So Noah here goes from the altar building here to vineyard planting. Now we've seen so much about worship over the last few weeks. We've looked at the worship that Noah had and we started looking at the first mention maybe two, three weeks ago. And with that, we seen the priority of worship. It ought to be a priority. And Noah made it a priority. He gets off the altar, or he gets off the ark and builds an altar. The purpose of worship, lift up the Lord. Now he knew he needed it. He couldn't go without the altar. Then there was these provisions made. God lined it up to where he had uh, these animals. He had what he needed for a sacrifice, and, and that's true as well. But not only that, we next week we looked at the price of worship. That you have to pay a price to, to worship the Lord. He had to build that altar. There was something uh, that uh, it took money, it took labor, it took time to build that altar. Uh, then there was the purity of that worship. He took clean beasts, clean fowl, and he offered that. But then we said the product of the worship, and we looked at that. But there's so much in that first mention. I truly believe that uh, there is no coincidences with God, and there's so much in this first uh, mention of the word uh, altar that uh, I believe this is another uh, reason why it was first mentioned. How quickly, I'm telling you this, how quickly we can lose the altars of our life. I'm telling you this. We've looked at the, all of this reasoning of having an altar. We said it's a place of sacrifice. We said it was a place of surrender. We said it was a place of devotion. A place that you've marked off and you've said, God, this is for you. But the thing about it is, you, you, you set up these places, you establish these places in your life, but how quickly can we lose that altar? So quick, quickly we can lose those altars that we have established in our life. I mean, uh, and, and we see that even with this first mention with Noah. From Genesis 8 and 20 all the way to Genesis 9 and 20, quickly, one chapter of the Bible, things change. One minute we're sacrificing to the Lord, the next minute we're turning our backs on the Lord. One minute we're surrendering to the Lord, the next minute we're living for ourselves and making our own decisions. One minute we're devoting uh, our lives to the Lord. The next minute we're controlled by sin. And we see that here in this text. How quickly, I'm telling you again, how quickly we can lose the altars. I didn't say lose your salvation. I'm saying lose what you've dedicated, what you've marked off, what you've said is God's. So quickly you can mark, uh, you can lose that, what you've said is the Lord's. And in our own life, we have places of sacrifice. In our own lives, we have a place of surrender. In our own lives, we have these places of devotion. A place that is so completely different than any other place. 
And we, we have this place, and, and I'll tell you, so often uh, we, we, we establish these places, we, we make these promises to God, and, and I'll tell you, so often we, so quickly, we, we lose the altar, we lose what we establish to the Lord. And I'm going to give you three things here this evening that the Lord uh, gave us here uh, in this text. Number one, anyone can sin. And I know that's deep this evening, but I'm telling you this, anybody can sin. If Noah can sin, anybody can sin. Because we go from Genesis 8 and 20, Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered a burnt offerings unto the altar. And then in verse 20, and Noah began to be a husbandman and he planted a vineyard and he drank off the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. One person is, is one person uh, can sin. Not no one person is above sin. I think we know the first mention is important, and I think the first mention is telling us, hey, uh, hey, church folk, we can build an altar, we can make promises to God, we can surrender things to the Lord, we can have these places of devotion. But so quickly, if you're not careful. You can, uh, our flesh, we're still clothed in and still wrapped in. There's still a devil that's in this world. And so easily we can lose what we've established and what we've got for the Lord. You say, how do you think that, preacher? Well, I believe this. If it happened to Noah, you better believe uh, somebody that hinged the life of all humanity. Uh, if it can happen to him, it can happen to anybody. We read of Noah before the flood, and you read of the time period before the flood. And I believe it's worth pointing out what the time was like. And in Genesis 6, and verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took the wives of all those that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Isn't that true? We are flesh. Noah was even flesh. And due to that flesh, we see that anybody can sin. But he says that we're all flesh, yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. And there were giants on the earth in those days. And after that, when the sons of God came and the daughters of men, they bare children with them, and they became mighty men, and they were old and renowned. And look at this, right here is where I wanted to get. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of, of the thought of his heart was on evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So that is the time period here before the flood. Then the next verses tell us about Noah. It tells specifically about his character. Look at verse. Number, skip ahead to verse 8, and it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Notice Noah found grace. I'm glad before they started talking about how Noah was right and Noah lived right, I'm glad the very first thing pointed out about Noah is he found grace. Let me just say this. Without the grace of God, you and I ain't nothing. I can, I can line it all up. I can do everything that I ought to do. I can be the person that I ought to be. But it's the grace of God. It's salvation uh, through, through faith in the Lord that makes us anything. But I do see that he found grace. We don't read that, that, that Noah was by no means perfect. He wasn't perfect, but he found grace. And in verse number 9, look what it says. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. Perfect in his generations. But then it says, and Noah walked with God. Noah was a just man, but he was perfect in his generation. The word perfect here don't mean the same perfect that we kind of sometimes think it means. It just means here that he had integrity, truth, he walked upright, and he can be used of God. That means in all the wickedness, in all the mire, in all the muck, Noah was somebody that could be used of God. And we know that it wasn't anything Noah was. It God done pointed out in verse number uh, 8 that God and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's only the grace of God that he could have been used anywhere. But out of all the humanity, Noah and his family were used of God. And let me just say this. If it can happen to Noah, it can happen to anybody. No person is above sin. Not even a servant of God. 
It don't matter who that person is. It don't matter where you serve at in the church. It don't matter how godly the person is. It don't matter how many Bible verses you have memorized. It don't matter what role that you have in the church. It don't matter who your mama is. It don't matter who your daddy is. It don't matter how long you've been saved. Every man, woman, boy, and girl is a sinful creature. And everyone, and I mean everyone, can still fall short. Now, we might be saved, but we ain't perfect. All we done was found grace, just like in verse number uh, 8. Noah found grace in the eye of the Lord, and that's what I've done. I found grace, and you found grace. But nobody's perfect. If it happened to uh, Noah, you better believe it can happen to any of us. But I see here, this is the first mention of the word altar. And I don't believe in any coincidences, but here in the first mention of the altar, here is Noah, and, and, and here it is in our own life. You think about it. We might be saved. We might have the Lord in our life. We might have him in our hearts. But we're clothed in that flesh and we do come up short. We sin. We come short of the glory of God. But here's the thing. We don't have to commit such a sin that it causes damage to our lives, causes damage to our family's life. But we're still going to come up short. We will. And I'm just saying in Psalm 53 and 3, it says, There is none that doeth good, no, not one. There's nobody perfect. In Proverbs 20 and 9, it says, Who can I say I have made my heart clean? I am pure from sin. There ain't nobody says your heart's perfect and clean. You can't do it on your own anyway, but there ain't none of us clean. In Isaiah 53, 6, it says, We all, all we like sheep have gone astray. In Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. In Romans 3 and 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And in 1 John 1, 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So I'll just say this. Anyone can sin. Anybody. Even this Noah, in verse number 9, said a just man, even called perfect in his generation. Hey, wonder if you put our, your name in front of that word perfect. Could we be perfect in our generation? Could we be clean? Could we be upright? Could we be used of God? I'm telling you, anybody can sin. I want to look at Genesis uh, 9 and verse number 20. Give you three points here. There's one. Anyone can sin. Number two, I'm telling you, it's a deep message this evening. Anybody can sin. Number two, sin is still sin. I'm telling you that this Sin is still sin. In other words, what God calls sin in this text is still a sin in 20 and 23. It's still a sin. In Genesis 9 and 20, Noah began to be a husband, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and was drunk, and he was uncovered within his tent. So we read here he began to be this husband. That doesn't mean that he's a husband. It means he's a gardener. Had to plant. He had to grow things. You imagine after that flood what the world looked like and how they need to replant and have these crops. Uh, after that flood, him and his sons done what they had to do. They had to plant food. Thus they began to be farmers. Let me just say this. They ain't nothing wrong with no farmer, are they? I mean, I like, I like uh, vegetables. And I love me. So let me say, there ain't nothing wrong with no farmers. Ain't, you ain't getting out of line being the husband. That, there's nothing wrong with that. We all like to eat. But here's the point. He planted a vineyard. See, the results of planting that vineyard in verse 20 are very, very, very clear. Look at verse 21. And he drank of the wine. So we see that he drank. He didn't just drink. It says he was drunken. That means become intoxicated. Third thing that he done, it says he was uncovered within his tent. I'll just say this. He made bad decisions. So he drank. He become intoxicated. And he made bad decisions. Let me just say that's what alcohol does. Alcohol does it. There's no such thing 
as just being a social drinker. When a person drinks, that's what you do. You become intoxicated. When you become intoxicated, which is why you're drinking, you become intoxicated, and a person makes these decisions, they make decisions uh, that you probably wouldn't normally make. In other words, he was uncovered within his tent. Resulting in what you're getting ready to see, the third point in a minute, is there's consequences to sin. But we're still at sin is still sin. Sin is still sin. I think this is interesting to me, and I don't know about you if you see it the way I do, and it seems like in study the Lord just made it so clear to me. Here's the first mention of the altar, and it truly is. But this is also in the same text within one chapter of your Bible, the first mention of wine and drunkenness. Is that not interesting? It's interesting that the first mention of the altar is followed within one chapter of the first mention of wine and drunkenness. Now here's the question. Was this the first time someone had been drunk or had it existed before? Did Noah know what he was doing or did Noah get caught off guard? Well, I'll give you two things on this. Number one is... You heard me read of what the times were like before the flood. In other words, in, in Genesis 6 and 5, God saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every imagination of his thoughts, of his heart, was on evil continually. Even to the point in verse 6 that the Lord had repented that he'd been made man. Even in verse 7, he's ready to destroy man. Sure makes one imagine that drunkenness had to have evolved, been involved in Genesis 6 and 5. Doesn't say that it was. But when their hearts are on every imagination, I'd say it's a lot like the world we live in today. That's I, I, just what I, I'd say. But it says this in, in Genesis 9 and verse number 21. It says, he drank of the wine. It doesn't say he drank of wine, he drank of the wine. Now, I'm not a Bible scholar by no means, but I was reading behind some Bible scholars, and here's what they say. By using the definite article, the, and then wine, he used the. Scripture is indicating that Noah knew what he was doing. He knew what fermented wine was and that it made a person so he used the wine. So we're not going to debate, but here's what we're going to say. We're going to conclude it's an enemy. Alcohol is an enemy. We're going to conclude this. Sin is an enemy, right? We're going to conclude this. At Genesis 8 and verse number 20, he built an altar. We're going to conclude this. That Genesis 9 and 20, he's building a vineyard. He's growing a vineyard. And the devil would love nothing more than to destroy the altar that has been established. So you say, preacher, what are you saying? All I'm saying that even simple disobedience from Genesis 3 harmed the relationship that they had with God. I preached that a few weeks ago on a Wednesday night, I believe it was. And even in Genesis 3, they hid themselves. And that was disobedience. I believe this is simple disobedience as well. So alcohol, no alcohol, it's disobedience. And when we disobey God, it is a sin. And how do you get from Genesis 8 and 20 to Genesis 9 and 20? He went from building an altar to planting a vineyard. At the surface, you say, well, planting a vineyard, it don't seem that bad. No, it don't seem that bad, but that's the way the devil works. No sin sounds that bad. And, and, and at the surface, it don't sound bad. But he went from altar building to vineyard planting to wine drinking. You see how it works? That's how sin works. It goes, you, 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 you just continue to snowball. You continue to stretch the goalpost, I guess you could say. So he goes from altar building to vineyard planting to wine drinking to being drunk and then follow that with bad decisions. 
Then we read in verses 22 and 23, it says, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. So he saw his father. He didn't help his father. But he went, told his other brothers, and Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it, laid it upon both their shoulders, both, both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. The word nakedness to me is an interesting word. The word nakedness in Genesis 9 and 23 means uh, shame and unclean. Uh, with that nakedness comes shame and uncleanliness. Now, with the word nakedness as well, it, it's a combination of two words. It's a picture of the eye and a picture of man. You have to be with nakedness. It's a picture of the eye and a picture of man. And you combine those they, you see a man, and what happens is the enemy is captured. And, and that's, what, uh, that's one of the examples of this word nakedness when you look it up. An enemy is captured. He's stripped of his clothes to the skin, and he's carefully watched. You know, it reminds me of Jesus, how he, he had his clothes ripped from him. He's placed upon that cross, and all the shame was put upon him. But that's what nakedness is. It's not just nakedness. It's shame. It's uncleanliness. It's something that the eye has seen. And by definition, what you can see here is you see sin. You know what I'm reminded of too in a, another timeout? It's Genesis 3 again. They were naked. They were naked there as well. They even clothed themselves and said, hey, we're still naked. So sin is sin. We're living in a time, guys, where we don't like to call sin, sin. I mean, we're kind of living in a day where even the sin that we see taking place in this text is, is not really, really, really frowned upon, right? There's a lot worse sins. In other words, I think of two sins that, that we, we, we once were appalled by, but you think of drinking, but you think of man and a woman shacking up, those two sins, or living together and all that, those two sins, we just, well, we shrug our shoulders at like it's nothing. But sin is still sin. All I'm saying is, in 2023, the world might say it's okay. Television shows may say it's okay. Movies may say it's okay. Uh, there may be more people uh, doing these things than not doing these things. But all I'm saying is God don't change and sin is sin. Sins that was once done in private. Sins that was once tried to be concealed are now out in the open and nobody's afraid of it. Nobody's worried about who knows about it. But God's God. God don't change and it goes all the way back again to Genesis 3 and simple disobedience. It has affected the whole world, and disobedience did that. There was disobedience in the garden, and it was that simple. And just disobedience affects us, and it still affects us to this day. The point I'm trying to say is sin is still sin. I was studying, and I was looking, and these other routes I could have went with this thought, but that's not what the Lord wanted. And the primary thing the Lord kept saying is, as I studied his burden in my heart, sin is sin. Sin is sin. It is. Well, he was just drunk. Sin is sin. So here, see here tonight that anybody can sin. I, I really believe anyone can sin. If Noah's sin, we see that sin is still sin. But lastly, this evening, we see the consequences of sin. Oh yeah, there's consequences to sin. No matter the sin, there, there, is, there is consequences. So here in the text, we see a son was cursed. His son was cursed. Look at verse 24. It says, And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what the younger son had done unto him, and said, Cursed be Cain, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. So Noah's youngest son, Ham, and we see that in verse 18, Ham is the father of Canaan. 
was cursed. So he sinned, and there was something to that, so there was sin there. And then we see a consequence of that sin is the son was cursed. I'm telling you, I wish everybody's listening to this tonight, but I'm telling you, that's a warning. And it's simply this. We don't realize how, how much even our sins are affecting our children and affecting their children and how sins are passed from generation to generation. When a child grows up in a certain atmosphere, they don't question it. That's the way mama and daddy did it. So that's the way we do it. But he was cursed. And I believe even in this first mention, you can either go the route of the altar and teach them what's right, or you can go another route. And not only that, you're going to make a mess, but now the curse is passed to the son. Pam. But then the other thing that I see with this consequence is there's nothing written. There's nothing written about Noah after this. I said there's nothing written about him. It's as though his life was, there was no more good left after he sinned. I don't know. They, they could have been nothing else written. But all I know is this. There's consequences to sin. No matter the sin, there are consequences. And nothing else is mentioned here uh, after his, until his death, that's the next time you hear of Noah. You know, as I was studying, it broke my heart, but I was thinking of so many folk that I know that have been in church. They've done things for the Lord. They've taught class. They've been in the choir. And all of a sudden, they get mad at something, and they're not, not, even, not even in church, in another church, but they're not in church at all. And what if the next chapter of their life is just dead. They sung in the choir, then a time passes, and then and then dead. What if that's all there is to it? What a shame that would be. I see that with these consequences, his son was cursed, and then nothing's written about Noah, but with these consequences, there are consequences to our sin, even even at an old age. Even at an old age. Noah failed at an old age. We know that when the ark was built, that he was 600 years old when the flood happened. And Noah had walked with God, as far as we know, for those 600 years. Especially the testimony from Genesis 6 that God sings that in Noah, to use Noah. So here he is, 600 years of walking with God. Yet, this sin happened. Now, this sin happened after the flood. We know that. And we know that he lived for 350 years after the flood. So just to use 300 and 600, because those numbers are compatible, what is that? It's a 2 to 1 ratio of living good to living bad, 2 to 1. That's pretty good, I guess. But the thing that stands out to me is not the 2 to 1, it's the 1 that stands out to me. 300 years we don't know what really took place during those years, but let's just assume for, for this sake that he lived two-thirds of his life for God. He gets to the end of his life, and a third of his life at the end, he don't live for God. The point I'm trying to say is Noah must have let up his guard for Two-thirds being good and then one-third being bad. He let his guard up, his spiritual life. He, he somehow left that altar, went another way. Sin took place and, and he went astray. But here's the thing. That, that, that's, that's happened before with other characters in the Bible and, and people that we know in the Bible. You think about Moses. Moses sinned later in his life. 
And he was never able to enter the promised land. That's in Numbers 20, uh, chapter number 20. What about David? David sinned later in his life. And in David, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He had her son, her, her husband killed, and that's in 2 Samuel 11. So even with these great uh, men of God that we know in the Bible, uh, sometimes in older age, things happen uh, to some of these men. But this is where I've got to have your attention. I'm telling you, and I'm not looking at nobody now when I say this statement, but there are older people at our church, right? We are. We have older members. We have younger members. But all I'm saying is this. It's really burdened my heart. When I look to my grandparents' life, and it, the grandparents that I know, the only thing I know about my grandparents, I'm just going to be real with you, you might have pictures from when they were younger. You might have heard stories from when they're younger. But for me and the grandparents that I know, I only know the last third. That's all I know. Let's be honest. Let's say that. I mean, uh, Harper, to be honest, is only going to know the last third or uh, last portion of Grandparents' life, that's, a bit, that's, a bit, that's just life. That's the way it is. Unless you live 900 years and like Noah. But the thing that stands out in my mind is what if, why does the last third matter? Well, we want all the grandchildren to, to, to desire God. We want all the grandchildren to come to church. We want all the grandchildren to have values that you had and maybe in the first two-thirds. But here's the last third and what's grandma and grandma doing? What does grandma and grandma think is important? And whatever they think is important, that's the only thing that they see. I was never able to see my grandparents walk down the aisle and get saved. I never see my grandparents if they talk. Sunday school, I never seen them teach Sunday school. And what you see as a, grand, as a grandchild is you see the last portion of what somebody has. And that really stood out to me in my study this evening is I've got to thank you, my gosh, we want them to put God first. But my gosh, the only grandparent that they know, they don't know all the good that you've done. They're watching you right now. They're watching you right this second. And how you live now is what matters. That's what matters. You can't bank off points from years ago because they can't read you that read the past and know you've done those things. All they know is you don't sing in the choir now. They don't know you didn't you sung in the choir for 20 years before. Do you see what I'm saying? I just think it's so important to finish the race. To finish strong. The grandparents, uh, and I don't know why I just had that on my heart, is you've got to persevere. You've got to continue. You've got to uh, pattern your life after the Lord so the grandchildren can pattern their life after somebody. You young couples this morning, you young folk, there's not many young folk. There's a few. There's a lot here tonight. But you young folk, you've got to go ahead and establish your life now. You don't want the first third of your life to be torment and craziness and somehow try to make it up on the second two-thirds. You may not get the second two-thirds. You never know. And I'll tell you this. what I bet every one of these folk that's been in it for years would say this. They were just in it from the get-go. If you're not in it from the beginning, it's hard to get in it later. That's just the truth. We see with the first mention of the altar that Noah went from the altar building to vineyard planting. He didn't just plant a vineyard, but he drank of that wine. He didn't just drink of that wine, he became intoxicated. He didn't just become intoxicated, he started doing something he shouldn't have done. Then that curse comes down to that one word, disobedience. He didn't keep a watchful eye. There's no way with the altar right in front of you 
in verse 20 where he built an altar. If you're valuing the altar, a place of sacrifice, a place of surrender, a place of devotion, a place of worship, a place of prayer. If you have that place in your life, it's hard to get off track. But when you get distracted, it's, it's easy to get distracted and, and go down the wrong path. So as Christians, we've got to stay strong. You say, how do you stay strong? You've got to stay spiritually strong. You've got to follow after the Spirit. Listen to the Lord. There's enough distractions in this world to do us in. Just this week, cutting on the news, there's enough distractions to do me the rest of my life. But we got to do all that we can to stay focused and stay on the path that the Lord would want us to, to, to stay on. Why is the Lord saying the altar is important? Well, I believe we may have times coming where we might need to hear this. Remember me preaching on money a few weeks ago and how uh, money wasn't going to last? Well, what happened? Then you see banks closing. It wasn't me, it's just the Lord. But he gives us things to prepare us, to get us ready. We need the altar. We have to have the altar. A place of sacrifice, a place of surrender, a place of devotion. I'll tell you this, there's no off days of being a Christian. There's no days where you can say, well, I'm going to phone it in, I'm going I'm to call in sick today. No, you're a Christian every day. Every day. We're as much, now listen to this, we're as much of a Christian Monday through Friday as we are on Sunday. We truly are. We're, it, that's the truth. As much as we're after him on Sunday, we've got to be after him daily. In 1 Chronicles 16, 11, it says, Seek the Lord and his strength and his face continually. Continually. Don't sound like there's a stop to it to me. In Luke 9, 23, it says, If any man will come after me, this is Jesus, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. We can't take breaks. You've got to follow him. You've got to go with him. And how do you do that? You've got to make the altar and time with him a priority. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in worship. And our personal altars are important. just wondered this evening, one, are you saved? Are you saved this evening? Do you know him? You say, it's Wednesday night. We all do. What if you don't? What if you don't know him? Here's the other question. Do you need to work on your altar? Do you need to work on it this evening? Do you need to uh, get something right with God? Maybe there's a part of your life that if that gets your attention, you're going to veer off quickly. It's like an exit on the interstate and you're drifting that way. Or maybe you just need to pray that others see God in you. Because, hey, we're making a difference every day of our life. You better believe the grandchildren are looking at you. Children are looking at you. Sin's still sin. We still ought to be after the things of God. I just wonder what you need this evening. We'll stop the camera. Might Gary come to the piano? We don't normally... Do this on Wednesday night, but we're going to let him play. Stop something softly here. You just mind the Lord.